Hello and welcome to Cherry Red TV. Today we've got another in our series looking at the stories behind some of the most iconic independent record labels in history. Today's label is Bella Union and I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by co-founder and general manager Simon Raymond. Hi Simon. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, now, in contrast to some of the people that we've interviewed previously in this series who kind of came into the label side of things through either being friends of bands or being from the business side of the industry, your background prior to starting the label was as a successful commercially signed recording artist. So can you tell us a little bit about that part of your life and leading up to it, the decision to start the label? Um, yeah, I was uh, lucky enough to be in a band called the Cocteau Twins and um, we were signed to uh, another iconic independent label called 4AD, um, which back in the day, you know, released some some pretty amazing r records over the years. And uh, yeah, I did that for, well, for 14, 15 years from when I was 19. Um, so, my, you know, the majority of my adult life has been, uh, has been as a musician, really. Um, so I think 1983 was when I jo joined the band. And, um, yeah, we were, we were in pretty successful, I suppose, and uh, had a pr pretty successful uh, relationship with our, uh, with our label for, for a good while, anyhow. And um, I think the experiences of, of, of being a musician on an independent label probably did lead us to the point where we decided we wanted to have our own. Um, I think in 19, around 1990, we were starting to get a bit disillusioned with, with um, our time at 4AD. And, I mean, in hindsight, I, I guess it wasn't really totally their fault. I, th I think we, we were, you know, perhaps a bit disillusioned with, with just the way some things had worked out. Um, and we moved to a major label, which, which really was a, a really disastrous thing for us to have done. <laughs> but it seemed like a good idea at the time. And subsequently, the two records we released on, on a major label just, you know, we realised what a, what a disastrous idea that had, that was. And at that point decided to, to start our own label. I think when you, you know, when you realise what you're giving up when you, when you do sign on with the devil, you know, I think um, you quickly realise that that life is far better when you're, you know, you're, you're really in control, even if you might not be selling as many records or have, you know, have the advances that you can get from a bigger company, you know, you realise that very quickly that um, you don't have to work with people that you don't want to work with. So that's how, that's how the, the idea of the label came about. And we set Bella Union up around about 1997, while the band was still going. But unfortunately, a few months after the, the the formation of the label, the band broke up. Probably as a result of all the pressure of being on a major label and the fact that it hadn't worked out, and relationship problems, and you know, a million and one other things that we can or cannot go into some other time. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we had a label and no band all of a sudden. And the, you know, at that point, I thought, well, we may as well put something out. And I just recorded some solo stuff in our studio. We had a studio in Richmond um, <clears throat> on the river, which was a beautiful place for us to have a base for a, a record label. We could bring people in, use this gorgeous studio kind of for free. I suppose you'd look at it like that. And, um, you know, it was Cocteau Twins money that was paid for the studio. And um, the idea being that we could probably make some cheap records, you know, um, how, how confident would you say at the outset that you were about the business side of running oh, the label? No, absolutely no confidence in it at all. <laughs> I mean, terrifying, really. I mean, because, I mean, I suppose we, we never had particularly good relations with our labels, uh, you know, in, in, over the great, over the whole period. It, you know, it went wrong both times. And we didn't know distributors, we didn't know managers. Um, we didn't know who did promotions or who the best people were to do anything. So it was a, it was a massive learning curve. So it wasn't the case that sort of previous contacts 
that you'd had in the industry through being with those labels were able to help you out? Did you kind of have <laughs> to really. stand on your own two feet yeah. from day one? Or so? Yeah, very much so. Because I think we'd burnt, burnt bridges with most of the people <laughs> that we'd come in contact with at both labels because, you know, perhaps we, we, our strongest point, you know, prior to setting a label up wasn't, you know, being in the band, our, our, our strength wasn't communication, put it that way. You and know. was it was it a frightening in a way to think that it was now your money that was funding the whole operation rather than relying on the money of a, a, a label being an independent or a major? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, well, I don't know about frightening, but it certainly was um, a bit daunting. And the realisation of what, what, what actually goes in to running a record label. Um, you know, I had no idea. I, I thought it was just find some bands and, you know, stick it out and see what happens. You know, I didn't realise, you know, all the things that you have to do and the care that you have to take. And, you know, it was, it was a f massive learning curve. And I would say it probably took, well, it took me at least five or six years to feel like it was something I could be any good at. You know, I, I always thought I, could, I had good taste and I always thought I had a good pair of ears and could spot a good, you know, band. I um, was never had any problems with my confidence in that front. But um, in terms of actually running a business, you know, I'd never ever saw myself as a businessman at all. You know, I, I never had a job, ever. You know, I worked on a building site for like a month in the summer once. <laughs> I worked in a record shop for a bit. But, I mean, that's hardly a job, is it? <laughs> you know, so I, 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 had no, I had no concept of budgets and forecasts and all that kind of stuff that you you eventually have to get into I had no idea and no interest in it really yeah and it was it was Robin Guthrie and yourself initially that kind of took on the the running of the label initially the because you know <clears throat> we were the sort of musical partnership of Cox Twins and um, Liz was always off doing her own thing anyhow so I think when uh, when she left the band we had this studio. Um, it was Pete Townsend's um, studio, Eel Pie, that was, um, you know, in, in, on the river in Richmond, and we, we rented it off him, and it was beautiful. And we wanted to keep that that whole place going because it was quite um, a sort of vibrant, inspira inspirational place to be. Um, so yeah, we 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 worked together on the label initially for the first year or two, but then we sort of we just kind of branched up off and away from each other I think it, Did you have kind of defined roles as such as to what you would do at the label or was it just Well I did um, everything <laughs> <laughs> I mean right. not, not, not to put Robin down it's just that he wasn't interested in in the label really as a label you know it was just a, a real a vehicle to put out to put out collaborations or Cox Twins records or his records or my records that was what it was for you know I don't think he ever sort of envisaged, envisaged sitting behind a desk on the phone talking to distributors and having meetings with promotional people and whatnot, you know. So I think very quickly <coughs> he just went and did his own music and I ended up doing more of the business side. Not because I, I not, you know, not for any, oh, well, I suppose I better add then. Not, not like that, it's just the roles we ended up falling into were those ones. And then it became clear after a few, you know, a couple of years, I think it was, that... Um, it, the business arrangement wasn't totally working out between us, and um, he was getting itchy feet as well, I think. So he just left and, and um, went and lived in France with his wife, moved, moved to France. <coughs> and, um, you know, he just carries on. He's a musician, and we, we have no business relationship um, on that front at all. And, um, I mean, in making the, that transition from being an artist to being a label owner, did you find that it changed any of your relationships with people in the industry at all? Um, I think initially, for the first four or five years, there was probably some scepticism about what we were trying to do and whether we'd actually be able to pull it off and whether it was just like a, a vanity project. A sort of boutique label was what I always used to dread reading in the reviews. And it took it took a few years for the for the reviews of our bands to stop saying former Cocteau Twins label or boutique vanity project. And every time that was in a review, I would like bristle because I didn't like the fact that people were reviewing us and not the band. Yeah. But um, I think after a while, people stopped associating Cocteau Twins and Bella Union, 
And once that happened, I, I, I stopped thinking about it and stopped even, you know, remembering that I was actually in that band. It's like I have two completely, two separate lives. That's some, that's ancient history. You know, it's a life I don't even really remember that well. It's like I was in the cops. Oh, yeah, I suppose I was. You know, it's a bit like that. So, um, given that. I think the label was kind of initially set up to be a vehicle to release Cocteau Twins material. Yes. And as you say, the band split up pretty soon after it started. Was the label kind of close to not happening at all? Um, no, I don't think so, because I don't, I don't think... Well, I'm certainly not one for giving up. I think having gone to the trouble of thinking up a name and coming up with a logo and, you know, printing up some postcards with our, with our label logo on it, it just... It would, it would have seemed a bit pointless just to give up at that point plus I had a record ready to go I mean the first release on Bell Union was, was my solo thing <clears throat> you know and because of the Cocteau Twins connection it and the interest that a sort of a Cocteau Twin putting out a solo record it had it had some press interest and media interest at the time so it got, got the label off to a pretty good start because it's you know it's all right and then um, then really the first major signing, I suppose, which I think is the third CD on Valley Union, was, was Dirty Three, was the album Motion Songs. And I think at that point, being able to work with a band that amazing um, was like, oh, this is pretty cool that these people aren't questioning whether we actually could be their record label. It was like, you know, contact Dirty Three, we, we're running a record label, do you want to... Yeah, sure. You know, and it was like, oh, this is easy. I mean, we didn't even have a contract with them. I still so don't they, think we have, you know. Did they have a, they had a record <coughs> out, in the, they had a label in the US. Yeah, they were right? on Touch and Go. Yeah, and you then became their UK label. And European. So were you kind of aware of them before you started the label? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd seen them at um, Phoenix Festival, was that, was that what it was called? Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I saw them there, They actually we were playing on the same bill as them, and um, they just blew my mind I thought my god they're amazing and we I think we hung out with them and made friends with them and and then all of a sudden we had this label and um it seemed you know we heard that they they didn't have a label in the U, in the UK <coughs> excuse me um so yeah it was just one of those sort of natural meetings um that that, that ended up being one that still carries on today you know 12 years later and it seemed like a fairly bold move to make one of your first signings a, a pretty much a, an instrumental act. And did did it kind of cross your mind at the time? Or no, and I don't ever think of it like that. I mean, I, I if there's one thing that I've always tried to carry through from when we started the label was sort of never to never to say never about anything and never to have an opinion about what something might sell or whether it was you know, um, marketable in some way. I've never, I've never really approached music in that way as a fan, certainly. And and I, I sort of, I can't really see the point in running a label from from my point of view. That's just like everybody else's, or where I can't, I just can't see my passion helping anybody. If I if I'm just going, well, yeah, it probably could sell well. Let's let's try and sign them. You know, we never had the money. We never had any money for years and years and years to sort of uh, to splash on a band that we thought could be the next big thing who knows anyway who i mean that's just not my not my area of expertise i have no idea what tracks will be good would make good singles i never have and i probably never will i just have to go on my instincts and what i think is a great song what affects me you know emotionally or whatever really that's how i usually go with these things gut instincts could never sign a band just because I thought they were going to sell the million records because I don't know. True. I thought they all would. <laughs> I did. Well, you hope Still they all do. Would. <laughs> um, I've seen in, in interviews with you where you talk about the early days of the label and you said that you made loads and loads of mistakes. Can yeah. you enlighten us as to some of them? I mean, were any <clears throat> close to being catastrophic? Um, well, I think you, you know, I think you do learn quickest and you learn your deepest lessons in life from the mistakes that you make not just in in the music business but in everything I think um, and I think it's mostly to do with the relationships you choose like with like with life too and I think we, you know we got into bed with some distribution people and some 
PR people and you know in the, in the business side of our company that were were totally the wrong ones because we need someone oh they oh they'll do it yeah let's go with them then you know whereas I think you, nowadays I would I would never do something without researching who these people were and what they'd done and meeting with them and forging some kind of relationship with them before we even got into bed together on on a business level I would never do that with a band at all anymore either and I think I also signed a lot of or we released a lot of records that weren't totally brilliant um and but and some bands perhaps that were good bedroom bands but hopeless outside of the bedroom um and of course that 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 is something that I, I learned that you know there's amazing music being made right now you know in, in a million places all over the world but that doesn't necessarily mean it's something that we that we should release on our record label so is that kind of something that you look for now in bands is that commitment beyond the music if you like yeah because if i'm if i'm going to the end of the world for them then i want them to go to the end of the world for me you know and I, they have to be a brilliant live act and they have to be lovely people it has to be the kind of people that i'd have around to tea and and that's as important to me as it being a good record to be honest because I've, I, you know, we've had experiences over the years where we've worked with bands that just don't get it, you know, and uh, it's just too much like hard work. And you know, if we're not getting paid very well, if we're all, you know, struggling to make ends meet, and you're working for people that are just, you know, unpleasant or ungrateful or looking at you as a stepping stone to something else, to be honest, I'd rather not bother. Yeah. Let them go somewhere else. Um, same with managers, you know. I, I'm, it's, I've, always, I've had a big bugbear with the managers over the years, probably because our own experience of them in our band wasn't particularly good. We didn't have, um, we didn't have a manager at all for the first eight years, and we got into some pretty hairy situations as a result of it. You know, didn't pay any tax for the first eight years. I don't think. Didn't even know. How, wow. Didn't even know you had to. <laughs> VAT and all that. You know, we we were just financially and as naive as it comes as naive as it gets, you know, we were just unaware of a lot of things until we got management in and then <clears throat> that management ended up not being wholly successful for us as people. I'm sure they had their best intentions but it didn't quite work out in the end. So it's probably given me a slightly, you know, jaundiced view of some types of manager because there are different types, you know. Yeah, I think there's certainly a whole uh, <coughs> cavalcade of yeah. managers and management styles out there. Yeah, and, and I mean, it really is quite straightforward. You know, a manager can very swiftly ruin a band's career. I can name you at least ten examples on my label of, of that where that's happened. I won't, for fear of being sued. But, <laughs> you know, that's definitely a, a relationship that is really important to me to feel confident about before we enter into a an agreement with a band. Is the band. Is the manager a good guy? Has he got an agenda? Or is there no manager at all? Preferably yes. <laughs> you know, because then, it, then it'll just become an easier relationship. And not because I'm trying to twist anyone's arm into doing something. Nothing to do with that. It's just sometimes uh, the management has an agenda that isn't to the best interests of all parties, put it that way. So one of the early signings, which I think was quite pivotal in the label's history, was Lift to Experience from the USA. Yeah, Can you tell us how, how that came about? Um, I was, yeah, I was in America producing a band called The Autumns, um, who got in contact with me, and I went out to uh, Napa Valley to this amazing studio, Tom Waits' studio in Katati, and working with this band... And the band arrived at the studio and they were just could not stop talking about this band that they'd seen or they played with on, on a recent tour in the States called Lift Experience. And uh, I said, you know, can we get, the, can we get them to send you a, um, a demo? And I said, yeah, of course. So they sent it over and we listened to it. I mean, they literally would not stop talking about how amazing a live band they were, the best live band they'd ever seen. You know, and the, it's not often you find great musicians talking about how, how, how great other musicians are. Yeah. It's quite often that you know musicians are a bit insecure about their place in the world and don't really like to 
to say that someone else is better in case you end up signing them and not yeah. <laughs> not them. Um, so I was kind of oppressed that, that they were going on so hard about it. And um, he said, anyway, I spoke to this chap on the phone, Josh Pearson, his name was. And, I mean, I guess in, t in your life, you know, you maybe meet, I don't know, three or four or five people in your entire life that make a severe impression on you where you are just actually almost speechless and you sort of, you feel like you're in the presence of somebody that you, I don't know, almost that, um, uh, genius is a really strange word to use because it's, it's a bit overused, isn't it? But somebody that's just super special. And I knew just from talking to him that he was out there um, in a good way. Yeah. Um, and I loved the music. I could hear something very special inside it, even though it was kind of a lo-fi um, demo. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I went out to Austin that year to this festival called South by Southwest, and um, I got invited to see this show, and it wasn't even it wasn't an official uh, South by Southwest show. It was um, off piste or whatever you call it uh, at this taco shack about thirty-five miles outside. And it was four o'clock in the afternoon, and it was um, we I had the whole label there with me. We'd taken about eight people over, and a couple of the, a couple of bands, and press guy, and you know me and Robin, and a few others. And uh, so this band walk on stage. This is an absolutely tropical thunderstorm, black sky, lightning, the thickest, heaviest rain, and then this band walk on stage with these sort of big Stetson hats and these big long beards and these Marshall stacks. And, and I mean, for the next 45 minutes, I'm, honestly, my I just don't remember breathing. And my heart just was, like, going so fast. I've never really seen a gig like it, and I, I probably will never see a gig like it again. It was absolutely astonishing. Powerful, beautiful, apocalyptic. Um, and, I mean, I literally... As soon as the show finished, I mean, I looked at Robin and said, because I told him to come along, and I, I looked at him and I said, we're going to sign that band right now. And he was like, yeah, go for it. So we went and talked to the talked to the band straight, uh, literally a minute after they'd walked off stage. They knew we were coming, and they were kind of excited to meet us and stuff like that because of the Cocteau's connection and whatnot. And, um, yeah, we kind of hit it off straight away. Um, signed the band, you know, within half an hour. <laughs> And pretty much the next year was, was quite an astonishing year for the label and for that band. Yeah, I mean, the album, the Texas Jerusalem Crossroads, it, it, it did amazingly well and it's so yeah. much critical acclaim. Mm. Do, you, do you think that that kind of really helped to put the label on the map? Oh, as without such? a doubt. You know, that record is... I, st I still think it's one of the most important American rock records of the last 25 years. You know, I don't think the Americans believe that because it didn't really get at all the attention there that it did here. Um, but when Alan Jones um, of Uncut wrote the most glowing review of it and a very intelligent review and a very insightful review, um, that really did bring a band quite quite a bit of um, attention for for the record, and quite rightly so. You know, they were they were extraordinary, and the record was hugely bold and ambitious for a debut record. You know, a double album about the end of the world. You know, in Texas of the Promised Land, it was you know, hilarious in a way, comical in its sort of lofty ambition. Um, but they had the confidence to pull it off. And Josh was an incredible, is an incredibly charismatic person. Um, and somebody you sort of hang on, hang on their every word. You know, he's a volatile character and, that, and good for him for that reason. Because there aren't enough people with balls around these days and he's got big ones. <laughs> And I really love that guy very much. I think they're an extraordinary band, and it's um, it's a shame that it, the band were unable to continue for a number of different reasons. But yeah, um, I think it, it it obviously had quite a big effect on you because, as you say, the band broke up around the time of the writing for the follow up album. Yeah, and, and I mean, yeah, it it was really sad, and I mean, I I, I mean, I'm sure mistakes were made on all, all behalf, on, on all sides, and um having been so deeply involved with that band, because, I mean, I also mixed the album in in 
in the in the dying embers of our studio as our studio was being repossessed and all the equipment was sort of by day disappearing to the receivers i was in there frantically all night long till sort of five o'clock in the morning trying desperately to mix this record and and not you know and, and not let the studio fall to bits completely till i had it done and um it's kind of a weird contradiction because whilst on the one hand my studio was about to go under and I would lose this beautiful riverside place, you know, with all these fantastic equipment that Cocteau Twins had bought over the years, it was all about to disappear. Yet on the other hand, I'm mixing one of the greatest records that I've ever heard. I'm having the most fun doing it. So at, you know, I'm dancing around the studio on my own at four o'clock in the morning, not feeling remotely tired, going, oh, this music is just like the best ever. I'm so privileged to be doing this. And then the next day coming in and, you know, the speakers have gone and the tape machines go in and it was a really strange time. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, maybe that that was kind of the a, a big, big moment for me because I realised that the studio, you know, if it goes, it goes. You just have to get on with things and not dwell on them, you know, because there's a lot of worse things going on, yeah. And you personally spent a lot of time and energy to try and get Joss Pearson to make a solo album, <clears throat> which I, I think at one time almost succeeded, didn't it? Almost. I mean, he was having a very bad time. Um, and, you know, he, he he was sort of... He'd bought this little ran, sort of a farm property or little ranch kind of thing. No, not a ranch. It's more like, I don't even know, I've not been there, but for not very much money, he bought this little place out in Tijuana in Texas, you know, miles away from anywhere. And he it was kind of the idea to go and just retreat and set a little studio up there and, and just get his head together. But, it, you know, it took him a long, long time. And, you know, all these stories would appear of, you know, of, of, of him just being in a bad place. And it worried me. And I, I perhaps I should have gone over there. Perhaps I should have given up more of my time to go and... Um, help him through whatever it was. But because, you know, I was having enough problems of my own, pers personal family problems of my own at that time, you know, I kind of um, perhaps needed to be a bit more selfish and just resolve some of these things at home. And I, 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 it's not that I ignored Josh, but I, you know, I perhaps let things fester in, in, in that way. Eventually I got through to him and we had lots of sort of long, long, hour, hour, uh, several hour long phone calls. And he was in a bad way. And I said, look, why don't you set yourself a, a project to do, you know, seven, so seven days, write seven songs or something, I don't know, biblical or, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. just don't, because he just like takes so long to do anything. And, you know, he... he I just felt, why don't you just do something to give yourself a bit of a break? And then, oh, you know, I'll pay for you to come over and come over and play the shows and then go back. I don't know, I was just kind of blathering on in the way that you do sometimes when you're trying to lift somebody's spirits. Yeah. And it, something I must have said just, just must have clicked a little bit because he was like, yeah, maybe, you know. And then I didn't hear from him again. Because what usually would happen was I'd, I'd feel quite excited when I got off the phone with Josh thinking I'd said something vaguely insightful that might give him, you know, uh, some some inspiration to, you know, to get well. And then I wouldn't talk to him again for a few months and the next time I'd hear he'd be back in a bad place. So I thought that was what was going to happen this time. Um, as it happened, I put the phone down and then, a, and then a week later, either he called me or I called him, don't remember. And he said, I've done it. And I said, well, I don't I didn't really totally remember the phone call, to be honest. Anyway, I've done, I've done the songs, I'll send you them. I was like, okay, cool. So he just sent me on real rough things on GarageBand or whatever it was at the, in, that, in that time. And they were absolutely astonishing. I mean, I just thought, my God. It was like Texas Jerusalem Crossroads, but from a personal... The songs were very personal, rather than being about, you know, a battle between good and evil that was, you know, not his battle, but the world's battle. Uh, this was very much his battle. And I loved that. And I thought, my God, these songs are, are absolutely astonishing. So I arranged a show at um, the Spitz Club, I think it was. Um, I think it must have been 2003. <coughs> Brought him over. 
he played this show, he's nervous as hell, you know. And a, a friend of mine, Giles, has got it on video, I think, and it was just one of the best gigs ever. And um, I said, right, OK, now you just got to go back home and record these songs. I think he'd bought a, we'd given him a little advance and he'd gone and bought the computer, a Mac, which seems so weird. Josh Pearson with a Mac recording <laughs> at home in his in his ranch in Texas. It didn't seem to make sense. I thought he'd buy a sort of a, you know, Fostex tape machine or something yeah. with a, you know, valve at desk. Yeah. But he bought a Mac. So anyway, I don't know whether he even got it out of the box because it just years went by and he he just never got around to it. Whatever was going on with him inside his, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think I'll ever, well, none of us will ever really know. Are you He's, still in touch with him? Yeah, I, I mean, we have had some ups and downs, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but I love him and I talk to him and he knows that if he ever wants any help and if he ever wants to put a record out, He's got a record label that would love to put it out. Whether that happens, whether it's just too too much has gone on, you know, with him and the band and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. It is a regret. It's one my, my one is big one one biggest regret. I think is that that relationship not and that band not quite working out as I would like to have done. And that. The Lift to Experience record seemed to kind of mark the beginning of uh, a close association with the label and bands from Texas. You know, Jet Screamer, Robert Gomez, Explosions in the Sky, Mid Lake, they all hail from Texas. Was there anything in particular about the area or the type of music that kind of brought that association together? I mean, I've thought about it a lot because, you know... It is a bit weird having five bands from Denton on your label, you know, when your label's based in Twickenham or whatever. <laughs> you know, it is a bit strange. Um, I'm sure part of it came out of the of the South by Southwest trips that I took. Um, but I think it's like anything in life. I think, you know, you meet people that make an impression on you. They tell you about other great bands that they've heard of. You know, my, my A&R isn't so difficult. You know, signing and finding bands is really not that difficult. You know, and I have to say that I... It, I don't discover bands all by myself all the time, you know, one or two for sure. But, I mean, I, I go on recommendations from other people. And as I said to you before, you know, if you've got a band recommending you a band that they've seen who, are, who they're, they're telling you are incredible, you'd have to be pretty stupid not to check it out. Yeah. And it was it was Andy Young, the drummer of Lift to Experience, that told me about Midlake. Um, he'd seen them in, in a bar in, in Denton where he lived, and he said, you've got to check these guys out. They're absolutely amazing. They're going to be huge. So I did. Sometimes it takes me a bit longer than it should, but, I, you know, luckily not that long. And um, I first heard the demos of that became their first album, Band Numbers Liverpool, and immediately knew that the, the, they were they were special. Even though I think the first record... There's traces of their influences, like there are on a lot of people's debut records... I think I could see beyond the Radiohead thing and the Granddaddy thing that that people were mentioning, and I could see that. Well, yeah, okay, they they obviously like those bands, mm. but you know, <laughs> seemed a, a little bit lazy at the time. Some of the the, the reviewing of it, the, yeah, you know, it was a lot well, of kind normal. of band comparisons as such. Yeah, I mean that is, that is what you grow accustomed to in the in the British papers, so. You're right. Um, I I never really heard the Granddaddy thing um, or the Mercury Rev thing. I never really heard it. That was what people compare them to a little bit. I think um, I could hear the Tom York thing in in Tim's voice a little bit, but I think that's just actually how he sings. You know, yeah. in the same way that you know uh, Matt from Muse sounds a little bit like Jeff Buckley, or so and so sounds a little bit like Scott Walker. Or it just sometimes happens that way. Doesn't make it good or bad, um, but I could anyway cut cut cutting through all that. I could see that there was um, an innate talent at songwriting, and arranging, and uh, interest in sounds, and just you know a band that were obviously really thinking about it and were really serious about the art of making records. And that's what you could tell within meeting them within five minutes that that's all they wanted to do. They just wanted to be the best band ever. You know, and um, 
they're a very, very, very interesting bunch as well because for all five of them, you know, vastly different, and they're a really fantastic bunch of personalities, and you know, they're they're great friends of mine. I absolutely love those. They're like my, you know, I'm like their uncle or something. I mean, I really feel very, very close to that those guys, and they of course told me about Robert Gomez and and then and Josh from the from Lift Experience told me about Chet Screamer and, and so on and so on. I haven't signed a band from Dex for a while, though. Yeah, I was going to say, little, even though there is on. that sort of close association, it's not as if the label's a one-trick pony in that sense. I mean, far from it. You've got kind of ambient artists like Rothko. You've got sort of trip-hop stuff like Kid Loco. You've got rap with Josh Martinez. I mean, it's it's quite a cross-section of musical genres. Is that something that you kind of have consciously tried to achieve with the label, or is it just down to the fact that you've heard that stuff and you've loved it and it doesn't really matter what the genre is probably a little bit of both really i think initially but, but when i said it, when I, my influences when i was growing up was I, I mean i wasn't really that into music until i was about 15 or until i was 15 when punk happened you know my 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 dad was a musician a very successful one he was a songwriter and a string ranger and um you know my brother was playing awful heavy metal records all the time and my sisters were listening to Gilbert, Gilbert O'Sullivan and awful things like that and I just was not bothered with music at all I was just playing you know, I was just playing football all the time and then and then I you know, was away at boarding school and punk happened and I was like alright oh, this is definitely for me this is my thing that no one else will get in the family and it uh, it really really took me over and I moved to London when I was 17 1979, you know, being in London in 1979, I mean, you couldn't pick a more inspirational period of music to be in London for. Yeah. And I think that, coupled with then getting a job at, Beg at um, Beggar's Banquet Record Shop when I was nine, when I was 18, 19 years old, and then following on from that, working in a bigger record shop where I suddenly wasn't just listening to punk and reggae records, was listening... Was, listening to Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and Steely Dan and, you know, Charles Mingus and, you know, wow, all this amazing stuff that I, I was very, very, very narrow-minded when I was a punk. I just think, you know, like Dylan. Oh, I couldn't stand <laughs> Dylan or, or, or the Stones or the Who or anything like that. Anything, anyone over the age of 24, I just thought was like a complete loser. You know, and then when I got a job in a record shop and some very nice manager of the shop he sort of kept me uh, late late behind after work and educated me in the ways of of um of all of, of all the, of the records that he loved and it was really educational for me i learned an awful lot in those couple of years and maybe that's given me the idea that you don't have to just have a label that people will always know what you're going to release next I mean, I've got classical piano records. I've got soundtracks. Um, you know, I think we've got a lot, a lot of different things. Having said that, I do think the the general perception of Bell Union is that we're in a sort of a folky Americana, sort of you know melodic pop guitar indie. But that's the kind of label we are. So I don't really see it like that. I just think, well, if I hear something good that I like, we'll we might be maybe we'll put it out. Whether it's Beach House, Andrew Bird, Vetiver. You know, I don't know. It could be anything. I don't Does that want annoy it to be you anything. In any way that kind of other people see the label like that. Not anymore. It, it probably did when I when I cared more about what other people think. <laughs> I don't really care anymore. Not not because I can afford to, but I just it doesn't. What difference does it make? You know, at the end of the day, it's all it's all the only thing I'm interested in. You know, is what is is music. I just love hearing different things. And different things means. That it may well be something like, you know, a Dustin O'Halloran solo piano record that just takes my breath away. It doesn't have to be something heavy or rocky or dubby or this or that. It just has to be like, oh, my God. You know, if it elicits that kind of emotional response in me, then there's a fair chance that I may well end up working with it. But it could be in any genre. I'm I'm not frightened of... Trying anything. I mean, the hip hop experiment was perhaps one step too far. I mean, the problem is, you know, whilst I love Josh Martina and I think he's really, really a superstar in my eyes, 
quite obviously he isn't. Because if he, if he was that good, then a lot more people would have picked up on it. Or my strength isn't selling hip-hop music because I don't know that world. I don't know those DJs. I don't know those journalists. Yeah, it is a whole other... It's a whole other world. And I've yeah. been a bit naive with releasing records that aren't um, in our comfort zone. You know, because I just thought, well, if we put it out and it's good, people will hear it. It doesn't work like that, of course. You have to market your records to the people <laughs> that might, might be interested in hearing them. And I, I didn't get that for a few years. And over the years, you've also become home to quite a few singer-songwriters, the likes of Laura Veers, um, Stephanie Dawson, Peter Broderick, uh, Fee and Regan. Mm-hmm. Um, they've all kind of come in, and, and you've worked with these individual creative talents alongside the bands on the label. Do they sort of provide a different challenge in the way that you work with them? I mean, there's... Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be really careful with singer-songwriters because there, there is such a, uh, you know, um, uh, over-proliferation. Is that a, is that a phrase? It's, it's like there's just so many of them. Yeah. So many singer-songwriters out there, you know, from James Morrison to, you know, uh, the guy with the dreadlocks, uh, what's his name? Ben Harper. No, yes, him. Well, I mean, <laughs> him or the, the guy that did the teardrop cover. Oh, uh, so him, you know, yeah. there's David Gray. There's there's like so many, and they're all of much of a muchness to to my ear. You know, it's all kind of like nice, and pleasant, and you know, it sounds a certain way. Um, and I'm I never really into I've never really been into that kind of music at all. Um, and then I suppose what was the first thing? I suppose the Laura Veers was was probably one of the first singer songwriter genre records that we put out, and. Um, I think her voice and her, the tone of her voice and the style of her singing and the banjos and, and just hearing something like, uh, I think the first record we released was Trouble by the Fire. Obviously the strength in her as an artist for me was the songwriting and the fact that her, she was actually from a punk, she was in a punk band and I could sort of hear that attitude in her songwriting. She wasn't trying to be like you know, Susan Vega or Joni Mitchell, or she wasn't trying to be something. She was just, you know, developing, having gone from being in a ba- band, a lot of people like, oh, I just want to, I don't like being in a band. Maybe I'll just sit at home and write some songs. And quite often that's how people come up with these things. It's not, it's not necessarily uh, an objective for people to become singer-songwriters. It's actually more of a necessity because they, they've had bad experiences being in a band, have felt like, oh, this, I don't like those guys. They're... But you've still got this burning thing inside where you have to do something in music. So you pick up a guitar and you end up in your bedroom at home twiddling around and then six months later you've written a bunch of songs. What am I going to do now? I suppose I'll go and play them. You know, and you buck up the courage to go out and play them and then all of a sudden you've got a record out and you're a singer-songwriter. It's, you know, it's almost just like happened rather than been something that's like, hmm, I think I'll be, you know? Yeah, and I've I've tended probably to work with those kind of people, um, not deliberately. I just think that's how it's worked out because I can maybe detect or subconsciously pick up on something in their music where I just feel there's a, a real burning, you know, Fire in there. yeah, something going on. Fionn Regan had it, and Laura definitely had it. Um, I mean, we released three really great records that she made. I love them all, and I'm very hopeful that I can work with her again in the future because she's a She's just written the most amazing new record, so I'm very hopeful we can, you know, maybe get back and um, work something out with her. But um, I mean, also it's an it, it's an easier relationship quite often than working with a band. It's a breath of fresh air sometimes. I mean, I won't be the first person that you'll meet that will tell you that Peter Broderick is one of the nicest people you'll ever come across in your life. He's just the sweetest person you could ever dream to work with. Nothing is a problem. Nothing is too much trouble for him. He'll do anything you ask him to and more, and he's such a delight to work with. Um, and easy, you know, touring is never an issue with him. Um, and you just think, oh, this is such a joy. Um, so obviously the simplicity of working with one or, 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 or a duo or something like that in terms of logistics and economics and just, you know, ease of decisions and what to do sessions as well if you've got an american band 
and there's I mean Aubergine. I just signed a Canadian band called Aubergine. You know, incredible bunch of musicians. Love it to bits. Um, but because they're in Canada and there's seven of them, um, there's certain limitations to what you can do in terms of uh, the cost. Uh, you know, you get asked to do a Radio Six session. Uh, is it worth bringing them over to do a Radio Six session? Seven of them. You know, that's like. 10 grand it's going to cost you just to bring them over just to so you have to sort of like when you're trying to break a band or get them some attention in the in the early days you it's obviously going to be easier having a Peter Broderick than it is having an Aubergine so from that point of view the singer songwriter side of Bella Union is, is yes it is a refreshing change for us and in 2007 you, you celebrated your 10th anniversary with the two nights at the festival hall mm. did that feel like a major achievement to get to 10 years with a label that you'd started from scratch and in what is now a kind of changing and challenging climate for the music industry yeah it was yeah i mean it, it was an amazing thing and i i did sort of shed a tear of pride at the shows um because it you know it's a, it's a beautiful part of london the south bank and um you know it's one of it, it felt like we'd done something pretty special to be able to put on, you know, eight bands across the two nights. Um, a, a, a bit like when, you know, uh, 33 headlined the Barbican and Q Explosions in the Sky curated ATP and, and then the year after 33 did the same, or vice versa. That you have a lot of pride in, in, in it when your band's sort of step the game up and there really does seem to be a, gen a, a real love of what they're doing. But that year w was a really, really tough year because even though on the surface the perception of a record label was at, was at, probably at its peak, I mean, at, at that point. Yeah, I um, think you'd had three Mid Lake had had a great, you know... Critically acclaimed yeah, that year was, you know, Fionn Regan was Mercury Prize nominated that year. Midlake was selling a lot of letter records and was, you know, one of the top couple of albums of the year. And you had the Deers who done. The Deers had done pretty well. well, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember the others, but Howling Bells perhaps as yeah. well was doing pretty well critically anyway. So on the one hand, you know, as far as the outside world looking in, wow, that label's doing pretty well. Their profile's really on the up. Whereas the reality was, where up from where I was sitting, was that the whole thing was about to fall to shit, you know, was, was, was really about to collapse. Because our, um, our international licensing partner at the time was going, th was going through um, some, some financial problems. <coughs> and uh, we were very reliant on, uh, on, the, on, on that money. You know, and at the end of that year, when we were due to get our next year's money, which, to be honest, we'd probably already spent half of it, borrowing it from our distributor. Um, you know, because that's what you have to do when you run an independent level. You're always a label. You're always borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Because, you know, in the music business, you know, I, I, I'm not being passionising trying to explain it in this way, but I think, you know, it, it's all about up It's all an upfront cost. Everything's upfront. You're front loading everything, and you're, you know, you have to put, whether you pay in advance or recording costs. Then you've got your manufacturing. Then you've got to pay for your artwork and your videos before you've even got to day one of release. You might have spent, you know, five thousand, ten thousand, twenty, fifty thousand pounds, and then the record comes out. Everyone hates it, and you've sold nothing, and you just, you just basically thrown fifty thousand pounds down the toilet. Um, so it's a massively risky business. Uh, yeah, when you're doing well, there are maybe more people who will say, well, look, you know, you're doing pretty well, so for the next year we're going to give you X. So when you know you're going to get X, but you need a bit more than X, you borrow a bit more, you know what I mean? So you're often playing a game of catch-up. Yeah, very delicate balance. It's a very delicate it. balance. And, yeah. you know, um, right at that point, if we'd had a much, much more stable financial position, because uh, we've never had, had backing from anyone, we've never had any investment from anybody. The company's peeled, you know, it's 100% owned by, by, by me and, and Robin at the time. Um, and without that funding, 
which which you know all you know bigger labels than than mine do uh, uh, do benefit from you're always trying to just pay the bills at the end of the month you're never able to go right now with this 50 grand we've got stuck in the bank what we'll do is we'll, we'll do this campaign and then that, then we'll watch that happen and you can't look at things um at, in long term or even mid term you can only look at things very very short term which of course isn't great when you have a band like midlake where you're on daytime radio one um you're critically acclaimed as one of the albums of the year so much same with fion if we'd have had 50 grand in the bank when those records were gradually gradually climbing up the, up the sales ladder, which they both were at a very similar time. They could probably both have gone on to sell hundreds of thousands of records, 100,000 plus for sure, because they were both good enough records, good enough live acts, with a sufficient enough profile at that time. Just from, you know, from my experience, I know that, that, that those are two, two achievable targets. Yet yeah, we had no money to invest in those records. Yeah. And at that point, I was like, I don't know if I want to carry on doing this, you know? It's a lot of work put in to to get these bands to work with you, and then you 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 know you have faith in them, they have faith in you, and then you're letting them down because you can't take it on to the next level. No wonder they go and bands end up going and signing with majors. It was this is what was going in my mind. I'm not necessarily saying that's this is the right. Well, I was right, but I I was definitely feeling a bit down about the whole thing, and and a bit like, what's the point if no one's going to get behind the label and you know, invest in it, then I'm not sure I can be bothered anymore because I'm killing myself here. <clears throat> so kind of off the back of that, a year later, you've now got what's become your first selling platinum album in the UK, which is the debut from the Fleet Foxes. Mm. So can you tell us a bit how that came about? And did that kind of change some of the things that you've just been talking about oh, for you, everything. the success of it? It changed everything, um, but it just shows that you know when I get my teeth in something, I, w- I won't give up, you know. And, and I think my dark period in the in two thousand and seven was only very temporary, and was um, as a result of seeing how successful we could be. It wasn't a case of like, oh, I'm, I'm just rubbish at this. We we can't we can't get any of these bands away. I knew that it was only a matter of time before we did get one of these bands away. And the only reason it hadn't happened to now was down to nothing, was not down to anything that we were doing wrong. It was just simply down to economics and the fact that we never, ever had any money to, to invest. Any. None. I mean, literally none. Um, get the band on the radio and get the band into the papers. That's that's the best we could ever do. TV advertising? Forget about it. Ra- radio advertising? Nothing. Posters? No way. You know, Nothing. Um, and of course, I think you're always going to hit a hit a level if you if that's if that's all you can afford to do, and that will be the de- the death of, of many many independent record labels before me and after me. Yeah. Um, but very fortunately, um, you know, my business circumstances changed at the back end of that year. Well, not immediately. You know, I had pretty much a year with no money at all coming in, none. Um, but then in I think, um, what, what year did Fleet Force come out? 2008. So, yeah, in, in, in the summer of 2007, I heard Fleet Foxes for the first time. Um, the Middle Lakes American agent, Trey, Trey, his name is, he uh, he called me up one day and we were just talking about Middle Lake and he said, oh, by the way, I, heard, I saw this amazing band in, 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 at this festival he was at and you should check them out. And he sent me the link, the MySpace link. <clears throat> and I um, went and had a listen late one night. And I th- White Winter Hymnal was was the first song on the MySpace player. Um, and I mean, within 10 seconds, I, I knew. I said, I have to sign this band. This is the best thing I've heard in ever, in forever. So I listened to it a load more. In fact, I had probably listened to it 100 times that night, just over and over and over again. I was like, God, this is so good. And um, wrote to the band on MySpace, or got their email or something, and, and made contact with with Robin, the singer, and um, you know began um, a sort of email fr- friendship with him, 
initially and told him a bit about the label and you know was surprised and delighted to know that he he, he was a fan of, of quite a lot of the bands he's a big fan of Midlakes and you know who knew about Cocteau Twins and stuff he's only like 20 21 or something at the time so I was surprised he even knew and um and then I then I went and met him and he came to London and uh, this is like in August or September I think 2007 and we got on like a house of uh you know so I became pretty sure that the band would, if if it was possible, to sign them. But of course, you know, whilst I was courting Robin on the one hand, you know, on the other hand, my the financial status of Bell Union and my own, you know, fears of of having another band that I couldn't invest in properly uh, was was the other, you know, was was what I was dealing on the other side. So I mean, I luckily I'm able to juggle things in my life, and I'm 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 not somebody that gets like so down. I just give up. I get buoyed by great hearing great music and inspired by it, and I, okay, that is so amazing. I'm going to make something work here, and luckily a few other people heard what I was playing them, and believed in it too, and some other things. I mean, I, I funnily enough, it, the Fleet Foxes album, incredible though it is wasn't the only amazing thing I, I heard. I was actually in Norway in the summer of 2007, sitting by this lake, by this fjord, considering my place in the music business and whether I wanted to continue. Um, it's, it's a beautiful festival, Oya Festival, and I, I had gone there in a bit of a funky mood about everything and came away thinking, oh, my God, what, what am I talking about? I've just heard Fleet Foxes things, the greatest thing I've ever heard. I've just heard this band, The Acorn, Glory Hope Mountain album. These these are the two greatest things I've heard in 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 years. I'd be an absolute idiot to just walk away from this right now. So I came back home much much happier and full of ideas and confidence about how to move forward. And I suppose that energy must have rubbed off on on some other people, you know. And all of a sudden, the business thing. Well, not all of a sudden, nothing ever happens in the music business all of a sudden, but over the course of the next six months or so, um, this the business relationships and the money that I needed without compromising my own position at Bella Union and having to give away anything, shares or anything like that, I managed to orchestrate a situation where I had this potential funding so that if things did take off to any level, um, I, I would, wouldn't miss a trick. You know, I wouldn't have to be uh, in the same boat as before with Midlake and Fionn Regan and stuff. And there you go, and that's what kind of what happened. And and the Fleet Foxes record and, and the signing has proved to be, whoa, phenomenal. I can't describe it. I don't think there's been a you know, a more astonishing, successful debut record for for a, you know, on any label for a long no. time. I think you it know. was almost universally loved last year, you know, by yeah. by press and public. And I mean the thing is I have had that with so many bands where I've heard it and thought, oh my God, this could be huge. But, you know, seeing it translate into not just uh, the enemy loving it or, or Uncut or Mojo, but then, like, The Guardian and Culture Show and Jules Holland and then and then Radio 1 and then Radio 2 and Radio 6. And it's like, it just, well, hold on. Every single thing we try and do works. Every time we do something, we sell a load more records. What the hell is going on? It was so bizarre. That every target we sort of set, and all they all be very small, organic things that we would do. We never wanted to ram that band down anyone's throat because that wouldn't. It's not appropriate for that kind of music. But um, it, you know, all the little things that we did, and and all the things the band did, most importantly, um, had a significant effect on people. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. It's not just, you know, it's not just. It's not just that it's a great album. I think. There's also something really honest about the music they make. And when you watch them play, of course, as many thousands of people now have done, you usually go away from that gig feeling pretty good about life. Like, you know, my God, hearing people sing beautifully. There's something very inspiring about that. It's astonishing, really, as a record, to to say that that's someone's debut album. You know, it's yeah. so... It's so fully formed. It's so fully formed in the songwriting and the arranging and the lyrics. Uh, it's hard to believe Robin was 20, 21 years when he wrote those songs. Still find it impossible to believe. Yeah. You know, um, and then 
seeing them go from the first show they came over and played at Hoxton Bar and Grill in London, just a lovely little titchy 250-capacity venue, and, uh, you know, full of nerves and all sort of shy and stuff, but super humble, packed club, because the vibe, the, the buzz from, from South by Southwest last year where they played a number of shows and, and obviously impressed the British watching media who'd, who'd heard a little bit about this band. For, to, to arrive here a few weeks after that and, you know, not knowing of what might happen in the year ahead. I mean, I could believe you sell 400,000 records in the UK in less than a year. I mean, that's really amazing. And I mean, uh, all thanks to the team. So it's, it's really, you know, my my role in it is perfunctory, really, I, I would say. You know, just lucky enough to have heard it before anyone else. <laughs> so has that kind of changed things in terms of the immediate and long-term future of the label? No, actually not in terms of what I feel I'm able to achieve or what, what, where I'm trying to go. Because I think the mistake would be to think that there are any more Fleet Foxes like you know that there's any more records like that or successes like that about mm. to happen that would be a a really foolish Plan mistake to make sell that many yeah i mean yeah. even their next record you know one cannot think like that because you know there's a million factors they could make a better record than this one and it could sell half as many <clears throat> so what does what does the immediate future hold for Bella union or any just carry on as the same you know the the, the team we have the partnerships we have uh, are good and they're working well there is the money there for me to be able to sign bands um without ever going stupid i mean i you know i would never sign a band for for a ridiculous amount of money never uh, you know because it's my money <laughs> you know what i mean i would never sign up i mean even fifty thousand pounds to me to sign a band would be like oh my god i could couldn't even go there you know i would never even dream of spending that much money on a band. i think a lot of the business ethos in the way you work is more around making partnerships with bands isn't it really than we're going to throw everything like this at you yeah because i think as i, I usually have these long conversations with artists before i because i want them to understand that there's a fair chance they'll sell no records at all so because for most bands that is the reality, the, the, whatever label you're on, whether you're on 4AD, Rough Trade, Beggars, or, 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 or Parlophone, or Fiction, there's a fair chance that you'll probably sell 100 copies. You might not. You might be one of the lucky ones and sell thousands. But the reality is, don't get into this thinking that, you know, it's all going to go fantastically well, because it it's, mm, probably won't. That isn't to say we aren't going to pull out all the stops to make sure we, we, we sell as many as, as it's possible to do. Um, but, but, but most importantly, we're here for you. You know, and not just to put your records out. That's not what Bell Union is about at all. It's about, like, meeting the band at the airport and helping them with their gear. And, you know, I've driven bands around Europe on tour in, in a van, you know, carrying their luggage. I mean, I, I get in there, do you know what I mean, get my hands dirty because that's what I like to do. I think when, when you enter, a lot of our bands are American or foreign or from foreign parts, and I think when you turn up in a new place, you do feel a bit, you know, like a fish out of water. And um, I've heard so many horror stories about great bands on other labels just arriving and uh, no one meet them and being expected to find their way here and there. And I mean, I would hate that. I, would, I, I want to have a label that I would like to have been on and have people... You know, I, I would say that the, 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 the staff that we have, the few staff that we have, they're all like best mates with the bands. You know, I, I have to have a little bit more of a distance these days, I suppose, because, you know, I'm the boss. I can't be like their best pal. And I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm in my, like, my, my, my mid 40s. I, I'm not really interested in being their best pal anymore, but I'm there for them in a in a sort of fatherly way or whatever to say, well, look. I know how that feels because I've done it. I I remember that. You know, you're worried about this? Yeah, I know. I would be too. Or, you know, you don't want to do that? No, I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to either. You know, I'm not going to be twisting their arm to do some some TV show or some ad campaign or something that probably may help their career or whatever if they don't feel comfortable about it. Because the long-term success will depend on those kind of small details because I remember 
when our labels didn't listen to our wishes, whether we were right or wrong, is almost irrelevant. But when they didn't listen to our wishes, I mean, I'm sure we were wrong more than we were right, then you find that that's when the kinks in the, in the armour start, the chinks in the armour start to appear. And you think, hmm. Actually, these people aren't that cool at all. They didn't get it. They didn't hear what we said because they just kept back, come back and said, yeah, but you are going to do that thing, aren't you? And you're like, well, no, we said we didn't want to do it. Um, and I don't want to be that kind of label because I just don't think it will benefit anyone in the long run because then the bands will just think, let's go and sign with a bigger, bigger company where we just get loads of money. And, you know, who okay. cares? It certainly seems to be an ethos that, that has been successful for you. I mean, so many of your acts are, are long-standing acts on the label, you know. They've had Some, several yeah. releases with you. I'd um, like... I mean, that's the aim. I do, I do like the idea of long-term artist development. I know that seems an almost alien thing to be discussing in today's very strange record business, but that's my interest. I No interest. I mean, and it's selfish, of course... It's purely selfish because I don't want to discover a band and get them 20,000, 30,000 records in the black to then have someone else step in when our contract's over and then take them up to a million. And I'll be sat there going, I had that band. I found them. I don't want to be in that position. Of course it's going to happen and will, will happen occasionally because, you know, you can't tie a band to you forever and if they don't want to be there, I wouldn't even want them to be on the label. I've said that to, to bands before. If it's not working out, let's just rip the contract up and you, you go. Because there's no, you know, nothing to be gained from having a miserable time just for the sake of a bit of paper, you know. Well, it's been a, a fascinating <clears throat> 12 years and um, a fascinating yeah. hour and a bit talking to you about thanks. it today. So thanks very much for coming in. Well, it was a pleasure. It was interesting for me too, strangely enough. And uh, join us next time for more label stories on Cherry Red TV.